So welcome uh, to all of you uh, for lecture 26, our last lecture um, for this class of structural geology and tectonics. And we are finishing with the second part also, um, which is the tectonics part. I hope you enjoyed that. And after telling you uh, so much about <laughs> um, the theory of plate tectonics, I have, uh, I think that it is always good to um, to have an open mind. And I think that it, it, this is important uh, for us because that's how new discoveries, that's how new models uh, come up. If we just close down and say, well, there is nothing else we can do in geology, then we are not going to do it. But I'm pretty sure we can improve on uh, the models we have. And what we haven't discussed is that uh, within this model of plate tectonics, there are also all sorts of observations that normally don't make it into the textbooks um, that appear to give uh, some difficulty in explaining these observations um, with the standard theory of plate tectonics. So this standard theory might need adjustments or a revision or a replacement. Uh, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> But as I was telling you, uh, many people build their career um, on already accepted uh, perspectives. Because let's say, you know, the people, uh, a generation that is older um, and has the power to decide, um, then they can select younger scientists based on what, uh, it, there is a lot of subjectivity. Science actually, is not what people on the street think. Science is as much um, infected by subjectivity and our, uh, our uh, psychological way of um, interacting with others as other uh, segments of uh, the human life. And um, this is, it is what it is. But I want to make you aware of this because I want you to be fair scientists. Uh, I want you to have the opportunities to grow, and when you'll when you'll be more mature, and you'll have the power to give chances to people based on the way that their capacities of thinking, based on their interest, and so on, not based on just repeating um, repeating uh, known models. So that's why I decided to give you a few ideas about alternative tectonic hypotheses, and alternative means something else, yeah, not plate tectonics. You might wonder, well, how come? So let's let's look what the controversy here is. And the, the reason I said it's muted is that it is not that much in the open. It is not recognized that it exists. Um, there are uh, authors and uh, of course, I, I encountered colleagues of mine, not here at, at, uh, in the department, a long time ago when I discussed, for instance, with some people about these alternative uh, views. Uh, some of these colleagues in the geoscience community told me, oh, yeah, these are crazy people like Locos. Uh, we don't have to, to listen to them. But I wouldn't say that. It's not that there are many people and uh, it, it's not that all of them are crazy. Uh, they ob obviously have a mind. They obviously have a reasoning and they have observations that they say, well, you see, how do you explain this observation? Yeah. So that's the idea. So. Um, because we have this dominance of the of the people who embrace the plate tectonic models mod, model and they don't want to accept not even to hear about someone who thinks in an alternative way these people who try to 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 uh, draw our attention cannot get their papers their articles their views published normally in the normal official journals now these are the main journals. Now we have some journals that do publish them because these journals are led by people who are, uh, as I said, open-minded in the most general way. And they think that the advancement in science is uh, by letting people, you know, uh, express themselves and offer alternative hypotheses. And this is what I want to uh, uh, basically encourage you to do as well. So. Uh, one of these journals, and I recommend that you, you um, check on the internet, the Society of Scientific Exploration. 
this uh, is a very serious society. It, it's not about geology. It has a lot of psychology, a lot of physics there, also some geology papers and so on. But these are people who are consecrated um, like um, scientists, but who in their field of expertise started seeing that we can think beyond the current boundaries. And they try, for instance, some of them try to explain the uh, UFOs, yeah, the unidentified flying objects or some uh, psychic phenomena like uh, telekinesis and things like this, telepathy and so on. So some of these people in a scientific manner, they try to research and uh, offer their views on these aspects. So it's good for you to, to look at the Journal of Scientific Exploration and read uh, papers from them. One of, um, you see Journal of Scientific Exploration in uh, 2000, published this article. And it's, it says plate tectonics, a paradigm under threat. Paradigm means a model. It's a very strong, robust model. And this author um, considers that this model is under threat. Now, this is a relatively uh, easy to read paper. He uh, offers some criticism to the model based on some observations. And here I'm gonna show you two important observations, which I think deserve merit for us when we think about uh, not seeing the plate tectonics model in a simplistic way, all right? So one of, of these observations is, uh, if we look at uh, tomographic uh, data, tomographic data, it uses basically seismic waves to investigate the structure yeah, of the earth. And uh, you see seismotomographic cross section across the North American continent. And as you can see, if you see uh, from A to A prime, you see here uh, basically this cross section. Yeah, so we, we are looking in a vertical plane. And what we look here from the uh, Juan de Fuca ridge here, so basically it's a mid ocean ridge, and we get into the continent. And they show the part of the continent, which is what we call the North American Craton, which is the oldest part, coldest part. And here is the thing, the thickest part in terms of the lithosphere. And what you can see here, basically, um, it, it shows that these cratons, and as an example, the North American Craton, um, they have basically, uh, the lithosphere here has a, a thickness that uh, varies between 250 kilometers to 500 to almost 500. Wow. So you can imagine now in your in our model of plate tectonics where we imagine that we have these continental lithospheric masses that float on top of the asthenosphere and so on. Now here we have some evidence that shows us well there is no asthenosphere in the sense of that weak part. <laughs> yeah. And basically this uh, craton seems kind of welded, yeah, Go, going very deep. So imagine how would this move around? Yeah, how would this move around? Maybe it can rotate, but how? So this is quite a serious uh, observation, in my opinion. It's not mechanically speaking. Uh, you kind of wonder, is this gonna go around the earth like this as we can move continents, uh, close oceans and so on? May I, yes, of course. I can. An observation. <laughs> yes, Gabriel. Um, maybe it, it could be um, explained not only by rotation, but yes. also with uh, some kind of deformation and uh, composition, chemical composition of uh, of the crust uh, by them. But I don't understand. What does it have the chemical composition of, of the crust? We've uh, because the, because of the uh, the deformation and the displacement uh, released, not only maybe it could be for example uh, uh, contraction and and some some yeah, well esfuerzos. we talk about the whole lithosphere here so the crust plus part of the mantle which appears kind of strong rigid yeah in the sense that it doesn't seem to flow I see what where you you mean that you you are saying well. 
maybe it deforms so maybe in, yes. in the end it flows yeah i i i understand which i think it, i encourage you not only you gabriel i encourage you all, all of you to try to to think i mean they, that's how we do we stress our minds and think okay maybe the, the, this is the case or maybe not yeah so so um we don't know uh, you see i read when the plate tectonics theory was basically uh was being born and people were putting together various observations there was ge this just a physicist you see his name here mcdonald um and he wrote a paper um and i, I read that paper and i was impressed that this was a man a really uh, you could see a very serious uh, seriously thinking scientist and as a geophysicist he said well i understand the mechanical model offered by my colleagues at that time in the 60s uh, and early 70s but i really don't understand how we can mechanically explain the movement of very thick uh, blocks so for him this was a problem and i think that yes i understand what you are saying uh, gabriel maybe in time maybe we have some sort of um uh, flow as we <laughs> discussed so so uh, often about it i don't know i don't know um it, it we either have an explanation maybe like this of, of this kind um or we might have to accept wh what many scientists before the plate tectonics were saying that actually the continental masses are fixed and you might wonder okay you bogdan taught us all this um, information gave us all this information just to tell us at the end that we can throw it in the <laughs> in the basura and uh, what do we do and uh, well i would say like this some of these people who propose alternatives they try to propose not only some of them say okay these are observations and they are not easy uh, basically integrated in the model we have other people can say okay how can we come up with a new with a new model that can fit these observations uh, there was um, there was um, how to put it um, big scientist in russia and the russian school of geology um, was for a long time very uh, resistant to the new model of plate tectonics in the past century at mid past century russia has a, a very big territory so the russian geologists uh, could observe many aspects of geology and they also have and had a very strong uh, oceanic uh, program like uh, investigation of oceans bathymetry collecting samples from the um, bottom and what happens is there was this uh, very famous uh, russian geologist called belousov and he never accepted the plate tectonic theory but he also tried to offer something he tried to offer a geodynamic model for the earth and one of his uh, as, uh the aspects he was saying was this the the fact that he was saying that there is a, an oceanization of the ocean of, of the continental crust he was saying that there is a transformation that converts the, the uh, granitoid the granitic uh, composition crust uh, converts it into more basaltic composition i don't know the details but uh, i have a mentor and um, a, for a good friend and former colleague of mine but he's older than i am he was a student of belousov and he was telling me about belousov and so on in russia now the idea is that some of these people would propose that maybe the oceanic basins we see today are places where you may have had a collapse of part of the of the lithosphere and on the sides uh, you would have uh, fissures along uh, which basaltic magma comes up and creates the, uh, today's oceanic floor and you would say well why would you have collapsed in the hypothesis in the hypothesis that the uh, earth over time has been expanding and if you have to expand the planet then you have to create new surface so basically this could explain this now many 
many scientists nowadays, they don't accept the expanding Earth hypothesis. But believe it or not, <laughs> I've read the book of a physicist who uh, actually was saying that uh, this has to do more with a universal aspect of uh, in the universe with the with the bodies that he was saying that basically in essence this theory that i was reading was that you know the gravitational uh, uh, attraction uh, law yeah of newton but what this uh, this author was saying was saying that when bodies are closer when they get closer they contract and when they get uh, farther away they uh, dilate and he was saying that this is something very um, common in the universe. Now, I, I'm not saying that it's like this, but there are people who actually, based on some observations, they offer models. And this is what we, I'm trying to, to bring the discussion now to, to our field and say, well, even in our field, we have this. And um, this uh, paper, I have it, I can give it to you to read if you are interested. Yeah. So this is one observation. Keep it in mind, uh, Gabriel, yeah. Um, the other one, which I think it's uh, interesting, is uh, we know that the, uh, Osha, the Pacific Ocean is the oldest. Now, what he's showing here, he's showing uh, regions from the Pacific Ocean and, uh, uh, and also some from the Indian Ocean, as you can see, uh, that what he's saying is these are former land areas, like pieces of continental crust that are now submerged. And according to the plate tectonic theory, that they shouldn't be there. <laughs> All right. Now, you, this, in theory, this should be easy to check if this is true or not. Uh, you might wonder, how do we know that they are there? Now, here is the thing. Samples taken from the ocean drilling program and so on, in many places within the oceans have encountered continental style rocks like granites, for instance. And there are papers that document this. So people imagine if, uh, if in the context of plate tectonics, you want to explain the existence of some small piece somewhere uh, of continental rocks, it's kind of how come, what, where is this from? Where, how come that you have it? So this could be another problem. I'm not saying that we have to dismiss the plate tectonic theory. I'm saying that in reality, there is a lot more work for newer generations to do so that we can um, basically get a model which can explain more and more of the observations. Yeah, so that's the idea. That's why I'm that's why I'm, I, I want to stimulate you. Yeah, I want to intrigue you uh, here. All right, so this is another aspect that, I, in my opinion, is quite an interesting observation. And obviously we have to account for such observations. I mean, we, if we have such large, you see this S1, he's saying uh, S1, area of Hontong Java Plateau uh, and so on. If this as a basement has, if it's, true that it has a continental crust, then well, maybe we should consider some, at least some uh, place for the ideas that there is a sinking of continental uh, land masses in certain situations. I don't know. All right, so here is his conclusion. Yeah, so he, show, he, he presents different observations. And uh, he says, like uh, talking about what Gabriel was asking, he says, the existence of deep continental roots and the absence of a continuous global astenosphere to lubricate plate motions have rendered the classical model of plate movements untenable. That's what he, he, he thinks. There is no consensus on the thickness of the plates, which is true. It's not, uh, you know, we have this tomography which shows, you know, variations. Um, and he also says, and no certainty as to the forces responsible for those post movements. Now you will say, Bogdan, but you told us that you have the ridge push and the slab pull, which is true. That's what we think. And the slab pull makes sense to my mind. But the question is first, the initiation of subduction actually doesn't seem to be a trivial process. 
I once encountered in Toronto um, a scientist who was trying to model the initiation of subduction. And he was saying, well, no matter what I do, <laughs> it just doesn't initiate. I don't know how, how it starts, yeah? So the, the point is that there are some aspects that we can say, okay, the model is working like this, but how does it start, yeah? So these are mechanical aspects that are important in my opinion. All right, so just for you, just some, some thoughts to, to think about. Here is another offer. Um, this guy comes from Australia. The previous guy comes from, uh, lives in the Netherlands. But Peter James comes from Australia and he published a series of articles in this journal called New Concepts in Global Tectonics. Now, you can see New Concepts in Global Tectonics has been set up by these people who want to discuss alternative hypotheses and they cannot publish their papers in the main official journals. And then they said, okay, let's, let's create a, 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 a journal called New Concepts in Global Tectonics. And here we can publish, like have peer reviews uh, and publish alternative hypotheses. So he published a series of papers, which he called geoid tectonics. You can read these abstracts. I, I included about four of them. But what he's saying, he, as you can see, he starts from paleoclimatic, paleomagnetic, and prehistorical data, he says, yeah? And what he's saying is that actually, we have the poles of the, of the, of the earth like this today, yeah? North and South. And that's the axis of rotation. But he's saying that the planet in geologic time is not that stable, kind of wobbles. And because it wobbles, uh, what happens is that the axis of rotation migrates, yeah? So it's like you have a sphere, and today you decide that the axis of rotation is like this, and tomorrow you rotate a bit the sphere and it's here and so on. So that's basically what Peter James is saying. And he's saying that actually a lot of uh, paleomagnetic data was interpreted wrongly, that he's saying, well, it's not that much that we have the continents that move, but we have the whole planet that moves and then the pole, uh, because with paleomagnetic data, you can see where the pole in the past was. And basically he's saying, well, it was actual uh, real polar wonder. Now, what he's saying is, think about the planet. It's not a perfect sphere, but the planet, because of the rotation, is a, a bit kind of, um, basically it's pushed. So the actual diameter, if you want, at the, at the poles, yeah, the two poles, is smaller than the one at the equator because of the uh, rotation of the earth, kind of the earth, yeah, <laughs> the earth is expanded a bit at the equator. So if you, if you are imagining this situation, if you, if you rotate, yeah, this and give it a new rotation axis, then you have to have a readjustment of the mass because the mass would go kind of, would expand at the equator and will basically um, be compressed at the pole. So what happens, he's saying the surface objects have to adapt to new radiuses, yeah, to new radiuses of curvature. So you have one radius of curvature at, at the equator, another one at the pole. So what he's saying is that in the past, before the plate tectonic theory, the geologists were saying that the mountains were formed in uh, in places that they were calling geosynclines. And in the geosynclines, they were saying, well, we have a trough, like a zone of sedimentation. So you have all these layers that you see afterwards in the fold and thrust belts. And the geologists are saying, well, we don't know before the plate tectonics, they were saying there is some process, probably to the, due to the shrinking of the planet due the, to the cooling, and the contraction of the earth, they were thinking. These uh, packages of layers deposited in the geosync lines would basically be inverted, would, would be crumpled, and you would have positive topography and the formation of the mountains. This was the old idea. Now, Peter James is saying, well, this was not such a bad idea because if something is at the equator 
and you have a sedimentation basin there, there the curvature radius is large, yeah? But then when the old equator is no longer at the equator because the planet has rotated and it goes to northern latitude, the, uh, the curvature, the radius is smaller. So basically all that surface has to fit on a smaller surface. So it crumples and you form mountains. And he's bringing arguments that the American uh, origin yeah, from north to south he says this was an old paleo equator that nowadays it's north south and it had to adjust to a new uh, to surface with different curvature radius and that's why you have the origin and at present day a place like indonesia he's saying this is where the geosyncline is and where the sedimentation happens it's at the equator and in the future there might be a future. So that's the idea, yeah? That's the idea he is promoting. But at least he tries to offer a model. And you can see here, uh, basically what I was trying to say in this summary, yeah? He says equatorial locations suffer stretching, yeah? Because you have the bulge, yeah? And um, um, the idea is that the, these locations, from the equators of the past uh, and are not those of the present. So the dislocations of the past must have undergone subsequent latitude changes and subsequent compression. And this produced folding up and uplift and formation of uh, mountains. So this is an idea. I'm not saying that it has to be like this, but what if this process exists in addition to what we uh, also observe? What if uh, it has a contribution. So that's why I think we shouldn't dismiss this idea because this person is not, in my opinion, he's not crazy. He has some observations if you read his papers and he tries to make sense out of them. So it's like a real scientist, yeah? All right, so just again, for you to, to keep this in mind. Here, <laughs> finally, uh, the third one, this is a book. And it's called Search Tectonics, a new hypothesis of global geodynamics. The lead author, uh, he died some time ago, uh, I, I think more than 20 years ago um, in the 90s, uh, Arthur Meyerhoff. He was an oil geologist, but a very, very um, encyclopedic uh, per person, like uh, knows a lot. And um, he put together, along with uh, uh, all these co authors, this search tectonics hypothesis and uh, it's a book it's well documented has lots of examples they offer an alternative model to plate tectonics basically and here is a bit of what it is basically they say that you have like uh, conduits of magma all around the earth and basically uh, you have this uh, this network of interconnecting mag magma cham chambers and you have episodic collapse of the lithosphere and uh, you see some processes. Now it might seem, it might seem weird to you, but he is talking from a, a, a planetary scale about the, the effect of the earth's rotation, uh, about the cooling of the earth. So there are so many aspects he takes into account that at least it deserves some uh, thinking, yeah? so. I just wanted to make you aware of the existence of alternatives. They are not that developed and embraced, yeah, as a model that we call as a model that that we call plate tectonics. Now, finally, and this is a final part of the final slide of the course and of this talk, is this comes from the book that I uh, suggested to you. I I posted the link. You can download it and it's called plate tectonics. So Frisch et al published a book on plate tectonics in 2011. But I think that he, this is a very nice person in my opinion as a scientist. He, you know, I, I use diagrams from his book uh, in our class. I think they are very nice, but he has this epilogue. And at the end, he says, look, well, he mentions someone, he mentions, uh, this person, Sekely, obviously an, a Hungarian name. And he says, well, 
uh, he compared basically, as you can see in the atmosphere, you see a cold front and a warm front, yeah? Uh, uh, it says a, a cyclonic storm, and you see this pattern of organization in the atmosphere um, is similar to the pattern that you observe, for instance, in the case of the Alps. The, uh, and you know, this chain, we, we, you see the Apennines in, in Italy and the Alps, and then they curve with the Carpathians. And in the country where I come from, the Carpathians turn at 90 degrees. So they come north, south, and then they go uh, east west and then they turn again north south and then east west in bulgaria uh, and so on it's quite amazing over a, a short distance relatively short distance you see these kind of zigzags you know uh, an origin so what i'm trying to convey is what he's saying is maybe you know no one explained okay do we have any similarity in between the uh, atmospheric pattern and the orogenic patterns. And this is what Frisch says. He says, well, maybe they are, he hints that they are ways of organizing something. They respond, maybe we have physical processes that reflect something, yeah, in different environments. One is in, uh, at, in the atmosphere, yeah, we have gases, one is in the rocks. But what is it? Why we have? Why do we have this similarity? So he's ending this by suggesting, yeah, by by suggesting that we have to have an open mind and we have to always inquire and understand things, yeah. And this is what I wanted to convey to you with this talk: not to not to throw away plate tectonics, not to cancel what we discussed, and so on, yeah. Just to broaden your horizon and stimulate you. All right, so this is it for today. This is it for the class. Thank you very much for being here with me, uh, all these lectures. Um, I really enjoyed having you and I enjoyed your questions. If you have questions, you're more than welcome. And one thing I want to ask all of you is when you come back on campus, and hopefully we will be able to do it, uh, don't hesitate to come to my door here, to my office, to meet in person with me. Uh, I am in the physics building 206. Yeah, so thank you very much, Dolores. Thank you very much, teacher. You are very welcome.